Um, Deviana blank sheets. If you want to, you know, do scratch work, you, you can have some blank paper. It is one of the things that is allowed. Um, yeah. <clears throat> and if you want to send pictures after your test is done, absolutely. And, and I can use that and take a look at it. Um, but um, the test is the final exam is set up basically the same way a lot of our tests were where it's like you fill in the blank with your answer and um, and maybe you'll write a sentence to describe you know uh, you know summarize the hypothesis test or or uh, confidence interval and things like that Alright, I hope you all are doing okay this morning. Um, I've basically got all the final exams ready to go. Uh, ready to go. The only thing I have left to do is like for people who are, who are picking times uh, a little bit later than we originally scheduled, we, I can just go back in and edit those pretty quickly. So um, This weekend I'm going to be grading all the exams. Um, your, your, your third exam is mostly graded already by uh, the, the quiz tool in Canvas, but I, I definitely want to go back and give partial credit for your multiple choice answers for those of you that sent me your work. And um, make, make sure that all your answers are graded correctly. You know, it's like you've entered a number and it's correct, but the it's not in the format that the that canvas recognized that, that it might count it as incorrect. So I'll be sure to do the same thing on the final exam. It'll take a little bit longer, but uh, I think it'll be all right. Yeah, for the uh, for the final exam, when you go take it in person, or if you're taking it online. You can have scratch paper. You can have the formula sheets. I remember, uh, last night, technically this morning, um, I posted the uh, final exam formula sheets. You can print those out if you want to have that ready to go. And 
you know, certainly you need your, your ID, as, as mentioned, and uh, then your calculator, whether you use the, uh, the 36 or the 83 or the 84, and then finally just something to write with. And if you go in person, you can also take a, a water bottle or, or something like that. So definitely uh, take advantage of that uh, if you want to. Um, anyway, I thought today we'd just go right through the exam, or, or the review, not the actual exam, but I think you'll find that uh, uh, you, will have, you will have to wear your mask throughout the test uh, if you are taking it in person. Generally, generally speaking, we'll have you uh, when you get to if you're taking it in person and when you get to the the testing area that you will be uh, placed at desks that are at least six feet apart, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, and we'll we'll certainly after each person takes the exam be uh, wiping down and cleaning up the area where you were and wherever else was before you. Um, just to uh, try to minimize the, any potential spread of the virus. Um, I think, by and large, most people are taking the online version uh, rather than in person, which is which is fine. Um, not that necessarily that either one is easier for you, for us on our end. So it's just whatever your preference is, but. Uh, I think most people did prefer to take the online version. Um, you, you'll if you if you have a, a written copy of the exam, you can certainly write on it all that you want, uh, including your answers. <laughs> but uh, you'll also be allowed scratch paper if you if you do want to work some things out, you know, on, on the side before you put it onto the actual exam. There are other questions before we look, start looking at the review. Okay, so question one is basically fill in the blank. We have three options for each part, whether it's a, a qualitative or, or a, what was the other word we use? Categorical or attribute data. B, quantitative discrete, or C, quantitative continuous. Those are both numerical data. And the difference between these is qu qualitative is something that describes um, the uh, individual um, with, uh, and it may include numbers, but uh, largely it will be non-numerical. If it does include numbers, it will be numbers that, uh, if we were to average them together, it would have no meaning. So your, your phone number, your zip code, your ID numbers, those are all considered qualitative because if we were to average those numbers together, it really wouldn't do anything for us. Quantitative discrete, this is numerical data that uh, counts the number of something. And quantitative continuous is numerical data that measures uh, the value 
for something. Okay, so countable and measurable. So things that we can count is uh, numbers of objects, uh, numbers of children, numbers of shoes that we own, pairs of shoes that we own, uh, things like that. Things that we measure is anything that has like a, a unit of measurement, like uh, uh, area, volume, time, uh, things like that. So when you go through and say, okay, we want the you know, length of time spent exercising each week. Since we're talking about a length of time, that is a continuous quantitative value. So that would be C, the first one. Number of senior uh, students in the four-year college. Anytime we talk about the number of something, that's always quantitative discrete. Same thing on number of tomato plants in the greenhouse. Both of these are, are B. Effectiveness of a public speaker. Well, we can't really quantify effectiveness unless we use like a. Yes, we, if we said that we said uh, effectiveness on a scale from one to ten, that quantifies it. But if we're just talking about the effectiveness, we're saying did they do a good job, a bad job, excellent job, awful job, you know, whatever whatever descriptors we want to use, that is qualitative. In that case, amount of money business spends on office supplies that would be continuous money is always considered continuous it's, it's it seems like something that might be discrete but it's actually continuous so that one's kind of a tricky one sometimes and then the favorite snack of Midland College faculty now we're, we're definitely looking at descriptors so that would be uh, qualitative or categorical uh, A Okay, so that's number one. A researcher used undergraduate students and had them view a 40-minute TV program that included ads for a digital camera. Some subjects saw a 30-second commercial, others a 90-second version. The same ad was shown either one, three, or five times during the program. After viewing, all subjects answered questions about their recall of the ad, their attitude towards the camera, and their intention to pur purchase the camera. Is this an observational study or an experiment? And then we want to explain our choice. Anytime we see different individuals getting different scenarios, in uh, statistical research, like one group received 30 second commercials, others 90 seconds, some received one ad, others received five ads. That's always going to be an experiment because uh, each group that we split these up into have received what we call a different treatment. Now, the treatment can be a variety of things. In this case, it's a uh, the length and the number of commercials that they've watched for this particular item. Um, or they could receive different doses of medication. That's more of the classical example, classic example. Um, but there's a lot of different things that could be considered treatment, so we don't want to you know, dismiss that outright. Uh, so this is absolutely an experiment because different treatments are being applied to different people. Okay. A sample of 22 college students who work part-time were asked how many hours they worked last week. The following data were collected. So we want to organize the data using a stem and leaf plot, first of all. Let me see if I can do this. Now remember, our stem and leaf plot means we basically split each number up into two components, a stem and a leaf. 
whenever we have two digit numbers it's very easy to see where the stem and the leaves are because the the tenth digit is the stem and the one digit is the leaf now we look at our numbers here we have uh, numbers in the tens the twenties and the thirties So one, two, and three are our stems. Now, let's start with uh, one. And we want to write down the leaves in order from low to high. So this is where you might want some scratch paper to do some preliminary work. Figure out where all your tens are first and then put them in order when you write it on the exam. Um, so we start off our lowest number is 10. And there's one two of those. So for 10, that means stem 1 and leaf 0, so 10 and 10. So we just put two, two zeros there for the leaves. After 10, we have 12. We have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 12s. Then we Twelve. There's fifteen, which we have one, two, three, four, five. No, four. That's not fifteen. Okay, I'm counting again. One, two, three, four, fifteens. And then eighteen. Oh, sorry. One. Two, three eighteenths. Next, we go to our twenties. Zero, 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 zero. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven zeros. That's probably going to be the mode, if I had to guess. But uh, we'll see what everything else. Um, let's see, after 20, what else do we have there? The only other number is 35, right? So, five down there. Now we have 22, 22 data values here. We can check to make sure we've counted 22 different things here. One, two, three, four, five. Too. So we're good. So that's our stem and leaf graph, or chart, whichever. Plot. <laughs> okay, next, in number four, we want to make an ungrouped frequency distribution. relative frequency and they also include percentage I never really separated those two but you know the person that created this test did want us to separate this so we can we could do that pretty easily though I keep bumping this thing sorry my hands are really cold this morning so I call my typing gloves on. It's at least my fingers free. Not optimal in the cold, but it works somewhat. Okay, so we have 10, 12, 15, 18, 20 and 35. So we actually only have six different numbers here. Some of them appear more times than others, though. Okay. 
let's count up the frequency for 10. That occurs twice. 12, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 12s. 15, uh, 4 of those. 18, we have 3 of those. 20, we have 7 of those. And 35, just 1. Now this should add up to 22. So it's 7, 11, 14, 21, 22. And this is a nice way of checking that, that we've done that correctly. Okay. So we've made the first two columns, now we can proceed to make the rest. The way that we calculate the relative frequency is we take the frequency divided by the sample size, which is 22. So 2 divided by 22. Let me just get my calculator over here. 2 divide 22 that is 0 0.09. And I actually, we'll go three decimal places, which that would be 9.1%. Five divided by twenty-two that is point two two seven. So twenty-two point seven percent. Four divided by twenty-two that's point one eight two. So eighteen point two percent. I don't remember if we asked for the percentage on the test. I know we get these first three columns at least. I don't remember about the fourth column. Sorry about that. Just be ready to do it just in case. At this point all we're doing is just dividing each of these numbers by 22. So pretty straightforward. And finally 1 divided by 22. That's 0 0.045. This column adds up to 1. This column adds up to 100%. Maybe a little bit off because of rounding. Um, in fact, this one is a little bit off. I think it it's, uh, adds up to 99.9%. .9%. Just looking at it. Um, but that's close enough because of the rounding error. We know that we're okay there. Okay, so that's our ungroup. Now, ungroup means we're just listing the values individually. So when you see that, we're not trying to make a group distribution like we, we did on our exam. Um, we're just making an ungrouped one, which means we list all the different outcomes, and there's only six. Find the frequency, the relative frequency, and the percentage if they ask for that. Okay. Now four, we want to go ahead and make a bar graph for this. Or five, I mean, sorry. I'll just do that next to it here. Again, we like to have a title, and we like to label our axes. This is our uh, frequency. Seven. It doesn't specify whether we should use frequency or relative frequency. I would choose frequency given the option because in this scenario it's much easier. Um, let's see, and now down here we want hours worked. Now because this is a bar graph and not a histogram, our bars don't have to be next to each other. So we have 10, 12, 
15, 18, 20, and 35. So 10, that's two individuals. 12 is 5. 15 is 4. 18 is 3. 20 is all the way up to 7. 35 we have just 1. That's our bar graph. Now, for this same data, we want to find all the measures of central tendency using a NSSTI calculator. But it, I mean, you know, whatever, whatever you're using, as long as it works for you, that's good. Um, so now we want to enter all of our data into our calculator. this one. This is where the stem and leaf comes in handy because we can just enter them in order. That makes it a lot easier in general, I believe. Let me clear these out. A little bit of a glare there. Um, so 10 twice. We get 12 five times. Fifteen four times. Eighteen three times. 27 and then 35 for the last one again make sure I always recommend going back through making sure we didn't uh, you know miss strike a, a number on the calculator like thought you pressed the one but then you didn't hit it hard enough and instead of putting 12 you just put a two that would give us the wrong answer anyway looks like we have everything correct here so we want to go like I did stat and edit to enter all the data on the 36x it you just go to, to data it's right here I did include, if you notice in the formula sheet uh, PDF I posted, I did include all the uh, calculator instructions that well, <laughs> that we previously used for our other exams. Now, uh, we press stat and then we go over here to calc one of our stats. Not 83, it's not quite as user friendly as the other two. Our data is in list one, which is second L1. Mm -hmm. Let me uh, let me enter the data in real quick. And 
35. Okay. So I did data. Oh, let's get out of there. Okay, so I do data. And that gets us right to our uh, value entry. Oops. Now here we'll go to second stats. And then there's one of our stats right there. And our data is in L1, so just press enter. Frequency is 1, always. And then just press calculate. And there's our numbers now. Here in number 6, we want the mean, the mode, and the median. Now the mean is going to be x bar. And you see on both calculators, it's given 16.77. The median is also going to be given on the calculators. We just have to arrow down. To where we eventually get MED for median, that's 16.5. And then what is the mode? Which one occurs most frequently? Well, this is where our frequency distribution is nice. We can see the 20 is the one that occurs most often. For number seven, we want the range, we want the variance, and we want the standard deviation. Now our range, remember, is our maximum minus minimum. Our minimum is 10. Oops. And our maximum is 35. So our range is 35 minus 10, which is 25. Our standard deviation, let's find that one first. That's SX on the calculator. And we see that's about 5. Point, let's call it 5.47. Now our variance is actually our standard deviation squared. We haven't really talked a lot about variance. This will formula is on your formula sheet if you, if you looked at it. Uh, well, all we have to do is take this number, 5.47, and multiply it times itself or, or square it in the calculator. So 5.47 squared and that gives us 29.92. I haven't really tested us on the variance because we haven't really used it for anything. In fact, this is probably the only time we asked for it is right here, looking at these measures of variation. Let's go to the next sheet. Be number eight. Now again, eight. This all comes from the calculator. We want our five number summary. So we have our minimum, Q1, median, Q3. And our maximum. So going back to our our stat, one of our stats, L1, one, 
calculate. Go down to the bottom. There's our five number summary. So 10 is minimum, 12 is Q1. Uh, 16.5 is the median. Twenty is Q three and thirty five maximum. So there's our five number summary. Now in number nine we want to find the lower and upper fence and determine if there are any outliers present. Now, before we can find the fences, we have to find the interquartile range. Q3 minus Q1. So that's 20 minus 12. That gives us 8. So the lower fence is Q1 minus 1.5 times the IQR. It's 12 minus 1.5 times 8. 12 minus 12, our lower fence is 0. And then our upper fence is Q3 plus 1.5 times the IQR. Q3 is 20 plus 1.5 times 8. So that's 20 plus 12. That comes out to be 32. Now, the way that we define an outlier is any number that's not between the two fences in the data set. So we go back and here's all of our data again in stem and leaf form. Are any of our data values not between 0 and 32? We say yes, there's one, 35, that would lie outside these fences. Okay. Mm -hmm. Our outlier is 35 because it's not between 0 and 32. And that's the only one. And typically this may either be the min and or the maximum that probably falls into this category because those are the lowest and the highest values respectively. And so if we do have an outlier, it tends to be one of those two. And sometimes both, depending on the, on the data. Alright, now we want to draw a box and whisker plot. So I'm going to set up the number line here. Zero is the smallest number we need. I'm going to count by fives all the way up to 35, so I need uh, seven more marks. four marks between each five number value. Okay. So we have a number line. Um, now our five number summary, we always plot that first. Uh, minimum is 10. Put a dot there. Q1 is 12. Put a dot there. Median is 16.5. We'll kind of eyeball where that one is. Q3 is 20. And the maximum is 35. So we'll draw a line connecting these five numbers. So there's our five number summary. The middle three, we'll draw these vertical lines and close this up as a box. And we also want to make note of our fences. Our lower fence is at zero, left bracket, and 
and our upper fence is at 32, right bracket, and we have an outlier at 35, asterisk. The same instructions are given on the formula sheet. It's actually the same formula sheet I gave you when we took this test over the first three chapters, all the way back in, gosh, September? It seems like so long ago. Any questions on the box and whisker plot? Okay. Eleven. Is the data skewed or symmetrical? Explain our answer. The three that I used? You mean to make the, the box? Just Q1, median, and Q3 is where our box is. Is that what you mean, Davion? Okay. So 11, we want to know if the data is skewed or symmetrical. Now we look at the mean, which on our previous page we said was 16.77. And we look at our median, which on our previous page was we're actually up here. 16.5 and we make our comparison between them now these I feel that they're close enough so they're about equal so we can say the data is symmetric And again, the, the comparison we use there is, is based on those two values, whether the mean is larger or smaller than the median. In this case, they're, they're really so close, I don't think we can distinguish that as anything else. I mean, technically, the mean is larger than the median, but it's not significant at all. So it's like within less than one value away, definitely call them equal. All right, and then 12, we want to determine if the data is compact or spread out. Let me get to Okay, and the reason, the, the way that we define or determine compact versus spread out, we find the range, which we said was, was it 25. So, oh, there, there it is. Yeah. And we find the standard deviation, uh, which we said was 5.47. Now we take our range divided by 4, which is 6.25, and compare that to the standard deviation. So the range divided by 4 is larger than the standard deviation, okay, and I forget what that means. <laughs> Let me bring up the uh, formula sheet real quick. Uh, 
However, for greater than s means it is compact. And again, for the formula sheet, this is what I'm looking at right here. The range rule says R over 4 about equal to S means normal bell shaped distribution, R over 4 greater than S compact, R over 4 less than S spread out. And then this is what we use right here for the comparing the median and the mean for symmetric skewed left or skewed right. Okay. And there's the instructions of the box, but this is the same sheet we had for uh, test 1. So, our conclusion is compact. Right. Now, that should get us away from the Chapter 1 material. Mm. Oh, 6.25 is 25 divided by 4. That's all we did there. 25 range, 25 divided by 4, 6.25. Standard deviation, that was from the calculator, uh, 5.47. That was our results from number 7, where we did that. Now 13, let me actually bring this back down. In a sample of community college students, the following three majors were listed, English, History, and Music. The table shows the number given of each major and classification. So we can see the totals going all the way across across the bottom and down on the right hand side for each one. There's 51 students here overall. I don't know why we didn't make that 50 so that all the calculations come out nice, but there we are. What is the probability that a student selected at random is a history major or a freshman? Now, or, we have to be careful about that because an or statement we know is our addition rule so we want, uh, that's 13A. And again, what tells us to use the addition rule is the present of the word or. And so this says probability of A or B is equal to probability of A plus probability of B minus probability of A and B. Now A, in this case, is history major. And B, in this case, is freshman. So P of A is probability of a history major. So we look at how many people are history majors. There's 21 history majors out of the 51 individuals. P of B, that's the freshman. So how many people are freshmen here? Well, we have 25 of the 51 are freshmen. And lastly, how many are both history majors and freshmen? So what number would that be? Ten, right. 
So 10 out of 51, exactly. Y'all are on top of this. So now we combine these together. 21 plus 25 minus 10. So it's uh, 46. 36 over 51. And at that point, if we want to make that into a decimal, that's fine. Um, 36 divided by 51. Comes out to be about 0 0.706. So B, given that the student selected is an English major, what is the probability that the student is a sophomore? This is the one that a lot of people missed on the exam, so we have to be very careful here. The given statement tells us that it's conditional probability. That's the key word that we're looking for there, given. And our conditional probability says that P of B given A is equal to P of A and B divided by P of A. Now the A is the given in this scenario. given that the student selected is an English major, so English major is the given part, that's A, what is the probability that the student is a sophomore, that's B, sophomore. Okay. So, we want P of A and B, which is both a sophomore and an English major. So we go across sophomores down on English majors. So 11 people match that criteria. Get out of that glare, sorry. There's 11 individuals that are sophomore English majors. And then on the bottom, P of A, which is English. We have 23 total English majors out of 51. Now, what happens here, so our 51s are basically going to cancel out. We get 11 out of 23, and uh, let's see, that is approximately, clear that first, 11 divided by 23. 0.478. All right, they gave us the two hardest ones first, you'll notice, which I don't know if that's meaning anything, that's just how it was asked. They did, you notice they did scramble the order a bit from how we covered it and how we did it in our previous test, too. Okay, part C. What is the probability that a student selected at random is a music major and a sophomore? Well, this is just an and statement, so we gotta see where those overlap. Music majors that are also sophomores, so that is this column, this row, so we get four total that match both criteria. 4 out of 51. And then the last question is, what is the probability that a student selected at random is an English major? Well, how many English majors do we have total? Let me see, we have 23. So that's just 23 
out of 51. And we can turn those into decimals if we want. Um, I think either answer will be accepted. Right, making good time here. I have a meeting at eleven o'clock, so I do hope we get done. It looks like we will, but I'm just putting that out there. So I have to finish by eleven. A recent study found that 60% of teenage consumers receive their spending money from part-time jobs. 20 teenagers are selected at random. So this is sample size 20, and we have a probability that 60% of them, or 0.60, earn money from part-time jobs. Now, this is binomial probability, the way that this question is pre presented. So in A, we want the probability that at least 16 work part-time. Now, let me show you the formula sheet on this. There's our addition rule, conditional probability. Um, and here's our instructions for binomial distributions. Uh, N is the number of trials, P is the probability of success, and N or X is the number of successes. That's something the difference. So I have instructions for each of the calculators. Now, hmm, this is not complete. Hmm. May have to update that real quick. Um, I'm just going to look at the exam real quick while we're not on my screen. Checking, I'm not on my computer screen. Okay. Um, let's see. Exactly seven, at least one, at least. So we will have to do at least. Okay. Oh, let me actually close that out. Okay. <laughs> So, if we use binomial PDF, that gives us the, oh, sorry, this is exactly 16, not at least 16. Okay. Then we use binomial PDF if it's the probability of a single value, which we're looking at 16 in this case. If we have a range of values from 0 to x, then for that we use the binomial CDF operation. Well, I'll come back to that. Okay. Switch over there. Okay. So exactly 16. That means we need to use, need to use binomial PDF. And the, the numbers we enter here are n, p, and x. n is 20, p is 0.60, and x is the relevant value from the question, 16 in this case. Now, this is how it ends up looking on the TI-83s, where we have 20, 0.6, 16. 
anything else will prompt you to enter those numbers yourself. There. So we go to second vars. We go down to normal, or sorry, binomial PDF. And we enter 20, comma, 0.6, comma, 16. And it gives us a probability of 0 0.035, let's call it. Okay. It's actually much easier on the 36 and the 84, uh, we do second data, go over to distribution, we arrow down to binomial PDF, which is much earlier on this calculator, single value. So trials, there's 20 trials, n equals 20. Successes, or success, probability of success is 0 0.6, and x is the number of successes, which is 16. We calculate see that we get the same number, 0 0.035. Okay, so we're able to get those values. Now, for B, Find the probability that most four will not have a part-time job. For this one, the wording is kind of strange, and I, I think we we didn't include this one in the final exam. I think A, C, and D are the ones on the final, not B. Um, just to, so, just those other three besides this one. But the wording is very specific. Four at most four will not. That if we interpret that, we can say at least sixteen will have a part-time job. Now the reason we have to reinterpret that in terms of the number that will have a part-time job is that our probability of success is the probability that they do have a part-time job, not the probability that they do not have a part-time job. So this is uh, 16 to 20. So the probability of 16 to 20 is equal to 1 minus the probability of 0 to 15. Okay. It ends up that we have to use the uh, complementary probability here. The, the way that binomial CDF works is that uh, if we use binomial CDF with a certain value of x, that gives everything from 0 to that value of x, so 0 to 15. So if we want to find the probability of, of landing in the 16 to 20 range, we have to find the probability of from 0 to 15 and then subtract that from 1. Now, let me just use the uh, 36 for this one since it's nicer. So second data, arrow to distribution, arrow down to binomial CDF, single, and then 20 successes, or 20 trials, 0. 0.6 is a probability of success. We want to use x equals 15. So I guess it's a value of 0.949, and 
And so if we subtract that from 1, that gives us point zero five one. That one's pretty tricky. Turns out, though, C is as well. C is the probability that at least 12 have a part-time job. So at least 12 means that we're looking at the probability of 12 to 20. Well, again, our calculator is not going to do 12 to 20. The best we can do is the probability of 0 to 11 and then subtract that from 1. Because we know there's only 20 individuals here, and they're discrete individuals, so it's if it's not in the 12 to 20 range, then 